volume three chapter four of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four an adventure another letter from miss morrison productive of a powerful effect upon her brother he forsakes his client and his friend agnes is left alone and employs some of her leisure in writing a letter to miss compton the following day was an eventful one for the first time since they had been in london agnes on seeing her aunt preparing to go out asked permission to go with her and you may go if you will was the answer but before her bonnet was tied on mrs barnaby changed her mind saying put down your bonnet agnes upon second thoughts i don't choose to take you look at all these things of mine lying about here i have told you that it is likely enough we may set off by a night coach and i have got as you know to go out with mr morrison so i should be much obliged if you would please to tell me how all my packing is to get done if you will let me go out with you now aunt i shall have plenty of time to do all that remains while you are out with mr morrison replied agnes agnes you are without exception the most impertinent and the most plaguing girl that ever a widowed aunt half ruined herself to provide for but i won't be bullied in this way either stay at home if you please and do what i bid you or before this time to-morrow you may be crying in the streets of london for a breakfast i should like to know who there is besides me in the wide world who would undertake the charge of you do you happen to know any such people miss if you do be off to them if you please the sooner the better but if not stay at home for once without grumbling and do what you're bid there was just sufficient truth mixed with the injustice of these harsh words to go to the heart of poor agnes her aunt compton in reply to a letter of mrs barnaby written in a spirit of wanton impertinence and in which she made a formal demand of one hundred pounds a year for the expenses of agnes answered in great wrath that she and agnes both had better take care not to change their residence so often as to lose a parish settlement for they might live to find that a much better dependence than anything they would obtain from her this pettish epistle received the day before they left silverton was carefully treasured by mrs barnaby and often referred to when she was anxious to impress upon her niece a sense of her forlorn condition and helpless dependence so all hope from that quarter seemed to be for ever shut out and could she forget that even at the moment when the dangers of her situation had so forcibly struck lady elizabeth norris as to make her approve that she had before declared to be worse than any home that even at that moment she had explicitly declared that neither herself nor her niece could take charge of her these were mournful thoughts and it was no great proof of agnes's wisdom perhaps that instead of immediately proceeding to the performance of her prescribed task she sat down expressly to ruminate upon them but the meditation was not permitted to be long for hardly had she rested her elbow upon the table and her cheek upon her hand in the manner which ladies under such circumstances always do than she was startled by a violent knocking and simultaneous ringing at the street door followed as soon as it was opened by a mixture of two or three loud and angry voices amidst which she clearly distinguished that of her aunt and the moment after she burst into the room accompanied by the gentleman who had appeared to admire so greatly in the street the day before together with two other much less well-looking personages who stuck close upon the heels of mrs barnaby with more appearance of authority than respect you shall live to repent this treatment of a lady cried mrs barnaby who was no other than the keeper of the livery stable from whom she had hired the carriage and horses which had dignified her existence for the last month you shall be taught to know what is due from a trumpery country tradesman like you to a person of my fortune and station what put it into your head you vile fellow instead of waiting for my return to cheltenham to follow me to london in this abominable manner and to arrest me in the public streets it is no difficult matter to tell you that mrs barnaby if that's your name replied the man and you'll find that i am not the only vile fellow holding himself ready to pay you the same compliment though i knowing the old saying first come first served took some trouble to be the first and do you really pretend to fancy you pitiful creature cried mrs barnaby in a voice in which terror and rage were struggling do you really pretend to believe that i am not able to pay your two penny half penny bill a thousand times over can't say indeed ma'am replied the man i shall not stand upon sending you to prison if you will discharge the account as here we stand paying fees and expenses of course as is fitting here are the items neither many nor high 
carriage and horses one month twenty-five shillings per diem thirty-seven pounds coachman's livery board and wages twenty pounds footman's ditto hired to order twenty-five pounds for a total of eighty-two pounds deduct liveries if returned minus twelve pounds remains seventy pounds and all our expenses and fees added won't make it above seventy-seven pounds or seventy-eight pounds altogether so ma'am if you are the great lady you say you won't find no great difficulty in giving me a write-off for the sum and my good friends here shall stay while i run and get it cashed after which i will be ready to make you my bow and say good morning the anger of mrs barnaby was not the less excited because what mr simmons the livery stable-keeper said was true and she seized with considerable quickness the feature of the case which appeared the most against him your vulgar mode of proceeding at cheltenham mr simmons is i am happy to say quite peculiar to yourselves for though for my age i have lived a good deal in the world i certainly never saw anything like it here have i like a woman of fortune as i am paid nobly since i have been in your trumpery town for every single thing for which it is customary to pay ready money and when a job like yours which never since the creation of the world was paid except from quarter to quarter has run up for one month down comes the stableman post haste after me with a writ and a rest i wonder you are not ashamed of yourself i dare say i should ma'am you talking so fine as you do if i had nothing to put forward in return i don't believe mrs barnaby but what you or any other rich seeming lady like you i don't believe but what any such might have come to cheltenham and have run up debts to the tune of a thousand pounds and not one of us taken fright at it provided the lady had stayed quiet and steady in the town where one had one's eyes upon her and was able to see what she was about but just do now look at the difference the season's pretty foolish says one and trades brisk that's true says another only some's goin off and that's never a good sign specially if they go without paying and who's after that shabby trick says another neither more nor less than the gay widow barnaby is the answer the devil she is says one she owes me twenty pounds i hope you are out there neighbour says another for she owes me thirty and me ten and me fifty and me nineteen and me forty and so on for more than all number and what pray is the wisest among them likely to do in such a case why just what your humble servant has done neither more nor less and what right have you audacious man to suppose that i have any intention of not returning and paying all i owe as i have ever and always done before nothing particular except your just saying ma'am that you should be back in two days and nevertheless not making yourself be heard of in ten and your rooms kept and your poor maid kept in em all the time too this man talks like one who knows not what a lady is said mrs barnaby her eyes flashing and her face crimson but i must beg to ask of you sir turning to one of the bow street officials whether i am not to have time allowed for sending to my lawyer and giving him instructions to settle with this fellow here why by rights ma'am you should go to a sponging-house without loss of time that we might get the committal made out and all regular but if you be so inclined as to make it worth while to my companion and me i don't think we shall object to keeping guard over you here instead while you send off for any friends you choose to let into the secret the friends i shall send to are my men of business fellow replied mrs barnaby with the strongest expression of disdain that she could throw into her countenance you don't i hope presume to imagine that i would send for any one of rank to affront them with the presence of such as you fair words butter no parsnips is a good saying and a true one but i'll add to it that saucy ones unlock no bolts and if you expect to get out of this scrape by talking big it's likely you may find yourself mistaken a bill must be a good deal longer than this man before the paying it will be much of a scrape to me said the widow affecting to laugh what a fool you are agnes she continued turning to the corner of the room into which the terrified girl had crept what a prodigious fool to be sure you must be to sit there looking as white as a sheet because an insolent tradesman chooses to bring in a bill of a month's standing with a posse of thief-takers to back it get up pray and bring my desk here i wish to write to my attorney in obedience to this command agnes rose from her chair and attempted to cross the room to fetch the desk which was at the other extremity of it but not all her efforts to arouse her strength sufficed to overcome the sick faintness which oppressed her do for god's sake move a little faster child said mrs barnaby 
but agnes failed in her habitual and meek obedience not by falling into a chair but by sitting down in one conscious that her fainting at such a moment must greatly increase her aunt's embarrassment i'll get the desk miss said one of the terrible men in a voice so nearly expressive of pity that tears started to her own eyes in pity of herself as she thought how wretched must be the state of one who could inspire such a feeling in such a being but she thanked him and he placed the lady's desk before her that pretty little rosewood desk that had been and indeed still was the receptacle of my lord mucklebury's flattering if not binding effusions and as the thought crossed the brain of mrs barnaby that she had hoped to make her fortune by these same idle papers she felt for the very first time in her life that perhaps after all she had not managed her affairs quite so cleverly as she might have done it was a disagreeable idea but even as she conceived it her spirit rose to counteract any salutary effect such a notion might produce and with a toss of the head that indicated defiance to her own common sense she opened her desk with a jerk and began editing an epistle to mr magnus morrison but this epistle though it reached the lawyer in a reasonably short time after it was written was not the first he received that day for the cheltenham post had brought him the following dear brother don't blame me if the gay widow i introduced you to the week before last should prove to be a flam as my dear father used to call it i am sorry to say there are great suspicions of it going about here she left us telling everybody that she should be back in two days and it is now more than ten since she started and no soul has heard a word about her since this looks odd and bad enough you will think but it is not the worst part of the story i am sorry to say pas de tout as you shall hear when she first came to cheltenham she took very good rooms a separate drawing-room which always looks well and dress and all that quite corresponding but no servants nor carriage nor anything of the high-flying kind now observe magnus what follows and then i think that you will come to a right notion of what sort of person you have got to deal with no sooner did mrs barnaby get acquainted with lord mucklebury than she set off living at the rate of some thousands a year and the worst is as far as i am concerned that she coaxed me to go round bespeaking and ordering everything for her i know you will tell me magnus that my father's daughter ought to have known better and so i ought but upon my word she took me in so completely that i never felt a single moment's doubt about the truth of all she said and i believe too that the superior sort of elegant look of that beautiful miss willoughby went for something with me having told you all this it won't be necessary i fancy to say much more in respect to putting you on your guard of course you will take care to do nothing in the way of standing bail or anything of that sort pas si bête you will say all cheltenham is talking about it and i was told at breakfast this morning that simmons who furnished the carriage horses and servants is gone to london to look after her and that wright the mercer and several others talk of doing the same tout cela mais oui but it can't be helped so many people too come to me for information just as if i ever knew more about her than anybody else at the boarding-table that queer lady elizabeth norris sent for me yesterday begging i would call upon her and when i got there i found it was for nothing in the world but to ask me questions about this mrs barnaby and there was that noble-looking colonel hubert who sat and listened to every word i uttered just as if he had been as curious an old woman as his aunt mais il faut dire magnus that men are sometimes quite as curious as women however they neither of them got much worth hearing out of me and yet i almost thought at one time that the high and mighty colonel was writing down what i said for he had got his gold pencil case in his hand and though it was on the page of a book that he seemed to be scribbling i saw plain enough by his eye that he was listening to me you know brother i am pretty sharp and i have got a few presents out of this fly-away lady let what will come of it but i could not help thinking magnus and if it was in a printed book it would be called a fine observation i could not help thinking how such a vulgar feeling as curiosity spoils the elegance of the manners lady elizabeth who has often told me that i speak the most exquisite french she ever heard and who always before yesterday seemed delighted to have the opportunity of conversing with me in this very genteel language never said one word in it all the time i stayed and once when as usual i spoke a few words she looked as cross as a bear and said be so good as to speak english just now miss morrison very impertinent i thought mais c'est égal don't think the worst of me for this unfortunate blunder let me hear how you are going on and believe me 
your affectionate sister sarah morrison mr magnus morrison had by no means recovered the blow given him by this most unpleasing news when a note from mrs barnaby to the following effect was put into his hands my dear sir a most ridiculous but also disagreeable circumstance has happened to me this morning a paltry little tradesman of cheltenham to whom i owe a few pounds has taken fright because i did not return to my apartments there at the moment he expected me the cause of which delay you must be aware has been the great pleasure i have received from seeing london so agreeably however he has had the incredible insolence to follow me with a writ and i must beg you to come to me with as little delay as possible as your bail i understand will prevent my submitting to the indignity of being lodged in a prison during the interval necessary for my broker who acts as my banker to take the proper measures for supplying me with the trifling sum i want in the hope of immediately seeing you i remain dear sir most truly yours martha barnaby mr magnus morrison was not so quick as it is called as his sister sarah and in the present emergency felt totally unable to fabricate an epistle or even to invent a plausible excuse for an absence which he nevertheless finally determined should be eternal he was ill-inspired when he took this resolution for had he attended the lady's summons he might with little trouble have made a more profitable client of her yet than often fell to his lot but he was terror-struck at the word bail and forgetting all the beefsteaks cheesecakes porter and black wine that he had swallowed at the widow's cost he very cavalierly sent word by the sheriff's officer who had brought her note that he was very sorry but that it was totally out of his power to come on receiving this message delivered too with the commentary of a broad grin even mrs barnaby turned a little pale but she speedily recovered herself on recollecting how very easy and rapid an operation the selling out stock was so once more raising her dauntless eye she said with an assumption of dignity but little mitigated by this rebuff i presume you will let me wait in my own apartments till i can send to my broker why tis possible ma'am you see that it may be totally out of his power too like this t'other gentleman and we can't be kept waiting all day you'll have a trifle to pay already for the obligingness we have shown and so you must be pleased to get ready without more ado you don't mean to take me to prison fellow for this trumpery debt tis where ladies always do go when they keep carriages without paying for them unless indeed they have got husbands as can go for them and as that don't seem to be your case ma'am we must really trouble you to make haste gracious heaven it is incredible cried the widow now really in an agony why fellow i tell you i have thousands in the funds that i can sell out at an hour's warning so much the better ma'am so much the better for us all as in that case we shall be sure to get our own at last and if the thing can be settled so easily it is quite beneath such a clever lady as you to make a fuss about lodging at the king's charge for a night or so pray miss can you help the gentlewoman to put up a nightcap in such like little comforts not forgetting a small provision of ready money if i might advise for that's what makes the difference between a bad lodging and a good one where we are going dick run out and call a coach will you all further remonstrance proved useless and mrs barnaby alternately scolding and entreating was forced at last to submit to the degradation of being watched by a bailiff's officer as she went to her chamber to prepare herself for this terrible change of residence the most bitter moment of all perhaps was that in which she was told that she must go alone for that they had no orders to permit the attendance of any one it was only then that she felt in some degree the value of the gentle observant kindness which had marked every word and look of agnes from the moment when her first feeling of faintness over she assiduously drew near her put needlework into her hands set herself to the same employment and with equal ingenuity and sweet temper contrived to make the long interval during which they had to endure the presence of two of the men while the third was dispatched to mr morrison infinitely more tolerable than could have been hoped for but on this point the officials were as peremptory as in the commands they reiterated that she should get ready promising however that application should be made for leave to let the young lady be with her if she liked it you may save yourselves the trouble brutes as you are cried mrs barnaby as with something very like a sob she returned the kiss of agnes i'll defy you to keep me in your vile clutches beyond this time to-morrow take care that this letter is put into the post directly agnes but i will give it to the maid myself it will reach my broker by four or five o'clock i should think and i'll answer for his not neglecting the business 
but it may however be near dinner-time before i get back so don't be frightened my dear if it is and here's the key of the money-drawer you know if you want to pay anything better divide the money-drawer with the young lady at any rate said one of the men laughing that you may pick my pockets perhaps replied the vexed prisoner have you enough money with you aunt whispered agnes in her ear plenty my dear and more than i'll spend upon them depend upon it she replied aloud this drew on a fresh and not very gentle declaration that they must be gone directly and the unlucky mrs barnaby preceded by one and followed by two attendants descended the stairs and mounted the hackney coach it was then that agnes for the first time began to understand and feel the nature of her own situation alone utterly alone in lodgings in the midst of london totally ignorant of the real state of her aunt's affairs and unhappily so accustomed to hear her utter the most decided falsehoods upon all subjects that nothing she had said on this gave her any confidence in the certainty either of her speedy return or of her being immediately able to settle all claims upon her what then was it her duty to do during the first few moments of meditation on her desolate condition she thought that the danger of being taken abroad could not have been greater than that which had now fallen upon her and consequently that lady elizabeth would be ready to extend to her the temporary shelter she had told her to claim in case of what then appeared the worst necessity but a very little calmer reflection made her shrink from this and the fact that colonel hubert was now with her which under other circumstances would have made such an abode if enjoyed only for a day or two the dearest boon that providence could grant her now caused her to decide with a swelling heart that she would not accept it the nature and degree of the disgrace which her aunt had now brought upon her was so much worse than all that either her vanity or her coquetry had hitherto achieved that she felt herself incalculably more beneath him than ever and felt during these dreadful moments that she would rather have begged her bread back to empton than have met the doubtful welcome of his eye upon seeing her under such circumstances this thought of empton recalled the idea of the person whose liberal kindness had for years bestowed on her this only home that she had ever loved was it possible that if made acquainted with her present deplorable situation she could refuse to extend some sort of protection to one whose claim upon her she had formerly acknowledged so freely and who had never forfeited it by any act of her own i will write to her said agnes suddenly rousing herself as it occurred to her that she was now called upon to act for herself god knows thought she what my unfortunate and most unwise aunt barnaby may have written or said to provoke her but now at least without either rebellion or deceit i may myself address her this idea generated a hope that seemed to give her new life and with a rapid pen she wrote as follows i can hardly dare to expect that a letter from one whom you have declared you never would see again should be very favourably received and yet my dear aunt betsy permit me once more to call you so how can i believe that the same person who took such generous pity on my miserable ignorance six years ago would without any fault on my part permit me to fail in my hope of turning the education she bestowed into a means of honourable existence and that solely from the want of her protection alas aunt compton i am most miserably in want of protection now my aunt barnaby of whose pecuniary affairs i in truth know nothing was this morning arrested and taken away to prison for debt her style of expense has been very greatly increased during the last few weeks and i have reason to believe that she entertained a hope of being married to a nobleman with whom she made acquaintance at cheltenham but who left it about a fortnight ago without taking any leave of her i am not much in her confidence but she has so repeatedly mentioned before me her determination to be revenged on this lord mucklebury as well as her certainty of recovering damages from him that i have no doubt her coming to london was with a view to bringing an action for breach of promise of marriage what confirms this is that the only person we have seen is a lawyer and the same spirit of conjecture which has made me guess what i have told you leads me to suspect also that this lawyer has persuaded her to give the project up for not only do i hear no more of it but she has seemed for the last week to be devoted wholly to seeing the sights of london in company with this lawyer i have not accompanied them not being very well nor very happy in a mode of life so much less tranquil than what i have been used to at empton i tell you all these particulars aunt compton that you may know exactly what my situation is i am at this moment alone in a london lodging my aunt barnaby in prison and with no little danger as far as i am able to judge that when she has settled this claim for her carriage and horses many others may come upon her my petition to you therefore is 
that you would have the great great goodness to permit my travelling back into devonshire to put myself under your protection not idly to become a burden to you but that i might be so happy as to feel myself in a place of respectability and safety till such time as my kind friend mrs wilmot may hear of some situation as governess or teacher at a school such as she might think me fit for i have very diligently kept up my reading and writing in french and italian with the hope of one day teaching both they tell me too that i have a good voice for singing as my poor mother had perhaps i might be able to teach that i shall remain here unless removed by my aunt barnaby of which i would give you notice till such time as the silverton post can bring me an answer have pity upon me dear aunt betsy indeed i want it as much now as when you found i could not read a line of english in your pretty bower at compton bassett how often i have thought of your flowers and your bees aunt betsy and wished i could be there to wait upon them and upon you your dutiful and grateful niece agnes willoughby number five half moon street piccadilly london having finished this letter agnes completed one she had before been writing to lady stephenson and then took her solitary way to a letter-box of which she had learned the situation at no great distance she heard her important despatch to compton bassett drop into the box with a conviction that her fate wholly depended on the manner in which it was received and having walked back as slowly as possible that she might benefit by the mild western breeze that blew upon her feverish cheek she remounted the dark stairs to the solitary drawing-room totally incapable of enjoying that solitude though it had so often appeared to her the one thing needful for happiness happy was it for her that she had turned her thoughts to her aunt compton for uncertain as was the result of her application there was enough of hope attached to it to save her from that feeling of utter desolation that must at this moment have been her portion without it the more she thought of receiving aid from the pity of colonel hubert's family the less she could feel comfort from the idea when it had been offered as a protection against the notice which they had imagined her likely to excite it was soothing to all her feelings but required or accorded as mere ordinary charity it was intolerable a melancholy attempt at dining occupied a few minutes and then hour after hour passed over her slowly and sadly till the light faded but she had not energy for employment not one of all her best-loved volumes could have fixed her attention for a moment she called for no candles but lying on the sofa her aching head pillowed by her arm she suffered herself to dwell on all the circumstances of her situation which weighed most heavily upon her heart and assuredly the one which brought the greatest pang with it was the recollection of having won the affection of colonel hubert's family just at the moment when disgrace so terrible had fallen on her own as to make her rather dread than wish to see him again End of chapter four volume three chapter five of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter v agnes receives an unexpected visitor and an important communication she also receives a letter from cheltenham and from her aunt barnaby agnes was roused from this state of melancholy musing by a double knock at the door is it possible she said starting up that she spoke truly and that she is already released the street door was opened but the voice of mrs barnaby did not make its way up the stairs before her a circumstance so inevitable upon her approach that after listening for it in vain for a moment the desolate girl resumed her attitude and endeavoured to recover the train of thought that had been broken but she was not destined to do so at least for the present for the maid threw open the drawing-room door and announced a gentleman agnes as we have said was sitting in darkness and the girl very judiciously placed her slender tallow candle and its tin receptacle on the table saying as she set a chair for the gentleman i will bring candles in a minute miss and then departed agnes raised her eyes as the visitor approached and had the light been feebler still she would have found no difficulty in discovering that it was colonel hubert who stood before her he bowed to the angle of the most profound respect and though he ventured to extend his hand in friendly greeting he took hers with the air of a courtier permitted to offer homage to a sovereign princess agnes stood up she received his offered hand and raised her eyes to his face but uttered no word either of surprise or joy her face was colourless and traces of very recent tears were plainly visible she trembled from head to foot and colonel hubert frightened as a brave man always is when he sees a woman really sinking under her sex's weakness 
replaced her on the sofa almost as incapable of speaking as herself do not appear distressed at seeing me dearest miss willoughby said he or i shall be obliged to repent having ventured to wait on you i should not have presumed to do this had not your friends your truly attached friends my aunt and sister authorized my doing so oh what kindness exclaimed poor agnes bursting into a flood of most salutary tears do not think me ungrateful colonel hubert if i could not say if i did not speak to you do you indeed come to me from lady elizabeth here are my credentials he replied smiling and presenting a letter to her we learned that your foolish aunt forgive me miss willoughby but the step i have taken can only be excused by explaining it with the most frank sincerity we learned that mrs barnaby having quitted cheltenham suddenly the ostensible reason for doing which was bad enough had left a variety of debts unpaid and that her creditors alarmed at her not returning were taking active measures to secure her person is this true is your aunt arrested she is replied agnes faintly good god you are here then entirely alone i am quite alone was the answer though it was almost lost in the sob that accompanied it oh dearest agnes cried colonel hubert in a burst of uncontrollable emotion i cannot see you thus and longer retain the secret that has been hidden in my heart almost from the first hour i saw you i love you agnes beyond all else on earth consent to be my wife and danger and desertion shall never come near you more what a moment was this to hear such an avowal human life can scarcely offer extremes more strongly marked of weal and woe than those presented by the actual position of agnes and that proposed to her by the man she idolized but let de la rochefoucauld say what he will there are natures capable of feeling something nobler than the love of self and after one moment of happy triumphant swelling of the heart that left no breath to speak she heaved a long deep sigh that seemed to bring her back from her momentary glimpse of an earthly paradise to things as they are and said slowly but with great distinctness no never will i be your wife never by my consent shall colonel hubert ally himself to disgrace had this been said to a younger man it is probable that he would not have found in it anything calculated to give a mortal wound to his hopes and wishes but it fell with appalling coldness on the heart of the brave soldier who had long kept cupid at defiance by the shield of mars and who had just made the first proposal of marriage that had ever passed his lips it was her age and his own that rose before him as she uttered her melancholy no never and agnes became almost the first object to whom he had ever even for a moment been unjust he gave her no credit no not the least for the noble struggle that was breaking her heart and meant most sincerely what he said when he replied forgive me miss willoughby had i been a younger man the offer of my hand my heart my life would not have appeared to you as it doubtless must do now the result of sober staid benevolence desirous of preserving youthful innocence from unmerited sorrow such must my love seem so let it seem but it shall never cost one hour's pain to you he was silent for a moment and had to struggle brave man as he was against feelings whose strength perhaps only showed his weakness but even so he added making a strong effort to speak steadily even so let me not be here in vain listen to me as a friend and father poor agnes this was a hard trial to save him worshipped as he was from a marriage that must be considered as degrading she could have sacrificed herself with the triumphant courage of a proud martyr but to leave him with the idea that she was too young to love him to let that glowing generous heart sink back upon itself because it found no answering warmth in her in her who would have died only to purchase the light of owning that she never did and never could love any man but him it was too terrible and the words hubert beloved hubert were on her lips but they came no farther for she had not strength to speak them another effort might have been more successful and they or something like them might have found way had not the gentleman recovered his voice first and resumed the conversation in a tone so chillingly reserved that the timid broken-spirited girl had no strength left to prick the sides of her intent and lay her innocent heart open before him in the name of lady elizabeth norris let me entreat you miss willoughby not to remain in a situation so every way objectionable he said 
my aunt and sister both are full of painful anxiety on your account and the letter i have brought contains their earnest entreaties that you should immediately take up your residence with my aunt do not refuse this from any fear of embarrassment of persecution from me i shall probably go abroad i shall probably join my friend frederick at paris he did you great justice miss willoughby and but for me perhaps forgive me i will no longer intrude on you forgive me tell me you forgive me for all the pain i have caused you and for more injury perhaps than you will ever know i never knew how weak i fear i should say how unworthy my character might become till i knew you and to complete the hateful retrospect he added with bitterness and rising to go to complete the picture of myself that i have henceforth to contemplate i was coxcomb enough to fancy but i am acting in a way that i should scorn a youth for who numbered half my years answer my aunt's letter miss willoughby answer it as if her contemptible nephew did not exist he shall exist no longer where he can mar your fortune or disturb your peace agnes looked at him as if her heart would break at hearing words so harsh and angry when losing at once all sense of his own suffering colonel hubert reseated himself and in the gentlest accent of friendship alluded to the propriety of her immediately leaving london and to the anxiety of her friends at cheltenham to receive her they are very very good to me said agnes meekly and i shall be most thankful colonel hubert to avail myself of such precious kindness if the old aunt to whom i have written in devonshire should refuse to save me from the necessity of being a burden on their benevolence but shall you wait for this decision here miss willoughby i have promised to do so replied agnes and as i may have an answer here on thursday i think at latest i would not risk the danger of offending her by putting it out of my power immediately to obey her commands if she should be so kind as to give me any the eyes of agnes were fixed for a moment on his as she concluded this speech and there was something in the expression of that look that shook the sternness of his belief in her indifference he rose again and making a step towards her said with a violence of emotion that entirely changed the tone of his voice agnes miss willoughby answer me one question should my aunt herself plead for me could you would you be my wife agnes equally terrified lest she should say too little or too much faltered as she replied if it were possible colonel hubert could i indeed believe that your aunt your sister would not hate and scorn me you might you will let me believe it possible you could be brought to love me to love me agnes no do not answer me do not commit yourself by a single word stay then here but do not leave the house stay till yet alas i dare not promise it but you will not leave this house miss willoughby with any aunt without letting me my family know where you may be found oh no said agnes with a reviving hope that if they must be parted which this reference to her aunt and his own doubtful words made it but too probable would be the end of all at least it would not be because he thought she was too young to love him oh no she repeated this letter will not be left without an answer and you will not stir from these rooms alone he replied once more taking her hand not if you think it best she answered frankly giving hers and with a smile moreover that ought to have set his heart at ease about her thinking him too old to love and for the moment perhaps it did so for he ventured to press a kiss upon that hand and uttering a fervent heaven bless and guard you disappeared and agnes then sat down to muse again but what a change had now come o'er the spirit of her dream where was her abject misery where the desolation that had made her almost fear to look around and see how frightfully alone she was her bell was rung her candles brought her tea was served and though there was a fullness and palpitation at the heart which prevented her taking it or eating the bread and butter good-naturedly intended to atone for her untasted dinner quite in the tranquil satisfactory and persevering manner that might have been wished everything seemed to dance before her eyes on couleur de rose till at last giving up the attempt to sit soberly at the tea-table she rose from her chair clasped her hands with a look of grateful ecstasy to heaven and exclaimed aloud he loves me hubert loves me oh happy happy agnes did you call miss said the maid entering from having heard her voice as she passed up the stairs agnes looked at her and laughed no susan she replied i believe i was talking to myself well that is funny said the girl and i'm sure it is a pity such a young lady as you should have no one else to talk to shall i take the things away miss 
once more left to herself agnes set about reading the letter which hitherto had lain untouched upon the table blushing as she opened it now because it had not been opened before the first page was from lady elizabeth and only expressed her commands given in her usual peremptory tone but nevertheless mixed with much kindness that agnes should leave london with as little delay as possible and consider her house as her home till such time as an eligible situation could be found in which her own excellent talents might furnish her with a safer and more desirable manner of existence than any her aunt barnaby could offer the remainder of the letter was filled by lady stephenson and expressed the most affectionate anxiety for her welfare but she too referred to the hope of being able to find some situation that should render her independent so it was sufficiently evident that neither of them as yet had any idea that this independence might be the gift of colonel hubert it is nonsense to suppose they will ever consent to it thought agnes and this time her spirits were not so exalted as to make her breathe her thoughts aloud but i never can be so miserable again as i have been it is enough happiness for any one person in this life that everybody says is not a happy one it is quite enough to know that hubert loves me oh hubert noble hubert how did i dare to fix my fancy on thee presumptuous but yet he loves me and with this balm acting like a gentle opiate upon her exhausted spirits she slept all night and dreamed of hubert the four o'clock delivery of the post on the following day brought her this letter from her aunt barnaby dear agnes the brutality of these cheltenham people is perfectly inconceivable mr creighton my broker and my poor father's broker before me came to me as early as it was possible last night and i explained to him fully and without a shadow of reserve the foolish scrape i had got into which would have been no scrape at all if i had not happened to fall into the hands of a parcel of rascals he undertook to get the sum necessary to release me by eleven o'clock this morning which he did good man with the greatest punctuality paid that villainous simmons got his receipt and my discharge when just at the very moment when i was stepping into the coach that was to take me from this hateful place up came the same two identical fellows that insulted us in half moon street and arrest me again at the suit of right such nonsense as if i could not pay them all ten times over as easy as buy a pot of porter but they care no more for reason than a pig in a sty so here i am shut up again until that dear old man creighton can come and get through all the same tedious work again you can't conceive how miserably dull i am and what's particularly provoking i gave order trying to have you with me as soon as old creighton told me i should be out by noon to-day and therefore agnes i want you to set off the very minute you receive this and come to me for a visit you may come to me for a visit though i can't have you in without special leave mind not to lose your way but it's uncommonly easy if you will only go by what i say set out the same way that we went to the church you know and keep on till you get to the haymarket which you will know by its being written up then when you've got down to the bottom of it turn sharp round to your left and just ask your way to the strand and when you have got there which you will in a minute walk on 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 till you come to the bottom of a steep hill and then stop and ask some one to show you the way to the fleet prison when you get there any one of the turnkeys will be able to show you to my room and a comfort i'm sure it will be to see you in such a place as this and do agnes buy as you come along half a dozen cheesecakes and half a dozen queen cakes and a small jar for about four or five shillings of brandy cherries and what's a great comfort i may keep you till it's dark which is what they call shutting up time and then you can easy enough find your way back again by the gaslight which is ten times more beautiful than day all along the streets from one end of the town to the other only think of that dirty scoundrel morrison never coming near me after all that passed too and all the wine he drank shabby fellow there is one very elegant-looking man here that i meet in the passage every time i go to my bedroom he always bows but we have not spoken yet bring five sovereigns with you and be sure set off the moment you get this your affectionate aunt martha barnaby it needs not to say the sort of effect which the tone of this letter produced on a mind in itself delicate and unsunned as the bells of the valley lily and filled to overflowing with the image of the noble hubert yet there were other feelings that mingled with this deep disgust she pitied her aunt barnaby and could any decent or womanly exertion have done her good or even pleasure she would not have shrunk from making it but what she asked was beyond her power to perform and moreover she had promised colonel hubert not to leave the house 
how dear to her was the recollection of this injunction how delightful the idea that his care and his commands protected her from the horrors of such a progress as that sketched out by her aunt barnaby to obey her was therefore altogether out of the question but she sat down to write to her and endeavoured to soften her refusal by pleading her terror of the streets at any hour and her total want of strength and courage to undertake such an expedition adding that she supposed by her account there could be no doubt of their meeting in half moon street on the morrow but the morrow and its morrow came without bringing mrs barnaby in fact writ after writ had poured in upon her but hoping still to evade those yet to come she only furnished herself with what each one required and so prolonged her imprisonment to the end of the week her indignation at agnes's refusal to come to her was excessive and she answered her letter by a vehement declaration that she would never again inhabit the same house with her this last epistle ended thus if you don't wish to be turned neck and heels into the street the moment i return look out for a nursery-maid's or a kitchen-maid's place if you will only take care never to let me set eyes upon you again ungrateful wretch what is morrison's ingratitude to yours for nearly seven months you have eaten at my cost been lodged at my cost travelled at my cost ay and been clothed at my cost too and what is the return i am in prison for debts which of course were incurred as much for you as for myself and you refuse to come to me never let me see you more never let me hear your name and never again turn your thoughts or hopes to your forever offended aunt martha barnaby little as agnes wished to continue under the protection of mrs barnaby this peremptory dismissal was exceedingly embarrassing she had declined immediately accepting the invitation of lady elizabeth in a manner that made her very averse to throwing herself upon it till a positive refusal of assistance from her aunt compton obliged her to do so and being absolutely penniless excepting inasmuch as she was entrusted with the key that secured the widow's small stock of ready money her only mode of not undergoing to the letter the sentence which condemned her to wander in the streets was remaining where she was till she received an answer from miss compton it is certain that she submitted to thus seizing upon hospitality with the strong hand the more readily as by doing so she was unable to obey the parting injunction of colonel hubert and bracing her courage to the meeting that must take place should mrs barnaby's release precede her own she suffered the heavy interval of doubt to steal away with as little of the feverish restlessness of impatience as possible End of chapter five Volume three, chapter six of the Widow Barnaby by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six. Agnes receives another unexpected visit. Mrs. Barnaby returns to her lodgings and catches the visitor there. The seven or eight months elapsed since the reader parted from Miss Compton passed not over the head of the secluded spinster as lightly as the years which had gone before, for her conscience was not quite at rest for some time the vehemence of the indignation and disgust excited by mrs barnaby during their last interview sustained her spirits much as a potent but noxious dram might have done and during this time the fact of agnes being her inmate and companion was quite sufficient to communicate such a degree of contamination to her as made the choleric old lady turn from all thought of her with most petulant dislike the letter of mrs barnaby demanding an allowance for agnes reached her just when all this violence was beginning to subside and acting like turpentine on an expiring flame made her anger and hatred rage again with greater fury than ever this demand was refused as we have seen in the harshest manner possible and the writing this insulting negative was a considerable relief to the spinster's feelings but when this was done and all intercourse as it should seem finally closed between herself and the only human being concerning whom she was capable of feeling any lively interest her anger drooped and faded and her health and spirits drooped and faded too she remembered when it was too late that it was not agnes's fault that she was living with mrs barnaby and conscience told her that if she had come forward as she might and ought to have done at the time of her brother's death the poor child might have been saved from the chance of any moral resemblance to the object of her aversion however much she might unhappily inherit the detestable wise at beauty then too came the remembrance of the beautiful vision whose caresses she had rejected when irritated almost to madness by the tauntings of mrs barnaby 
and the idea that the punishment allotted to her in this world for this flagrant act of injustice was the being doomed never to behold that fair young creature more lay with a daily increasing weight of melancholy on her spirits it was on the afternoon of a fine september day that the letter of agnes reached her as usual she was sitting in her bower and her flowers bloomed and her bees hummed about her as heretofore but the sprightly black eye that used to watch them was greatly dimmed she had almost wholly lost her relish for works of fiction and reading a daily portion of the bible which she had never omitted in her life was perhaps the only one of all her comfortable habits that remained unchanged it would be no easy matter to paint the state into which the perusal of agnes's letter threw her self-reproach was lost in the sort of ecstasy with which she remembered how thriftily she had hoarded her wealth and how ample were the means she possessed to give protection and welcome to the poor orphan who thus sought a refuge in her bosom all the strength and energy she had lost seemed to rush back upon her as her need called for them and there was more of courage and enterprise within that diminutive old woman than always falls to the lot of a six-foot two dragoon her resolution as to what she intended to do was taken in a moment and without any weakening admixture of doubts and uncertainties as to when and how but she knew that she should want her strength and must therefore husband it her step was therefore neither hurried nor unsteady as she returned to the house and mounted to her sitting-room the first thing she did on entering it was to drink a glass of water the next to endite a note to the postmaster at silverton ordering a chaise and four horses to be at compton bassett by daybreak to take her to the first stage towards london she then rang her bell gave her note to peggy wright the farmer's youngest daughter who was her constant attendant and bade her request that her father if in the house would come to her immediately there was enough in the unusual circumstances of a letter received and a note sent to excite the good farmer's curiosity and he was in the presence of his landlady as quickly as she could herself have wished sit down farmer wright said miss compton and the farmer seated himself i must leave compton bassett to-morrow morning farmer wright she resumed my niece my great-niece i mean miss willoughby has written me a letter which determines me to go to london immediately for the purpose of taking charge of her myself surely miss compton you bean't going to set off all by your own self for london exclaimed the farmer not if i can manage before night to get a couple of servants to attend me farmer wright stared there was something quite new in miss betsy's manner of talking you are a very active man farmer in the haymaking season continued miss compton with a smile do you think that to oblige and serve me you could be as much on the alert for the next three or four hours as if you had a rick to say from a coming storm of rain that i would replied wright heartily do you but bid me do miss betsy and i'll do it then go to your sister appleby's and inquire if her son william has left squire horton's yet i need not go so far for that miss compton will is downstairs with my missus at this very minute said the farmer that is fortunate he is not likely to go away directly is he no not he miss betsy he has come to have a crack with our young uns and it's more likely he'll stay all night than be off in such a hurry then in that case have the kindness farmer wright to saddle a horse while i write a line to the bank i want you to ride over to silverton for me to get some money and i'll do it replied her faithful assistant leaving the room fortunately for her present convenience miss compton always kept a deposit of about one hundred pounds in the bank at silverton in case of need either for the purpose of making the loans which have been already mentioned as a principal feature in her works of charity or for any accidental contingency beyond this however she had no pecuniary transactions there as her habitual secrecy in all that concerned her money affairs made it desirable that her agent should be more distant this fund however was quite sufficient for the moment for as will be easily believed miss compton had no debts farmer wright speedily reappeared equipped for his ride you will receive ninety-seven pounds sixteen and two pence wright said the spinster giving her draught would it suit you best to receive the rent miss betsy before you set off said the farmer it will make no difference you know ma'am if i pays it a fortnight beforehand not an hour upon any account right replied his punctilious landlady i will leave written instructions with you as to what you are to do with it and about all my other affairs in which you are concerned and now send william appleby to me this young man the nephew of her tenant and the ex-footman of a neighbouring family had been favourably known to her from his childhood 
and a very few minutes sufficed to enrol him as a servant with an understanding that his livery was to be ordered as soon as they reached london this done mrs wright was next desired to attend her and with very little waste of time or words it was agreed between them that if father made no objection which both parties were pretty sure he would not peggy should be immediately converted into a waiting-maid to attend upon herself and miss willoughby this last arrangement produced an effect very likely to be destructive to all miss betsy's quiet well-laid plans for preparation for the news that peggy was to set off next morning for london very nearly turned the heads of every individual in the house the mother of the family however so far recovered her senses as to appear again in miss compton's room at the end of an hour but with a heated face and every appearance of having been in great activity i ax your pardon miss betsy a thousand times said the good woman wiping her face but peggy's things you know miss compton can't be like yours all nicely in order in the drawers and we must all wash and iron too before she can be ready but here i am now to help you and i can get your trunk ready in no time i shall take very little with me mrs wright replied the old lady who seemed as much au fait at what she was about as if she had been in the habit of visiting london every year of her life nor must peggy take much she added gently but with decision and getting her things washed and ironed must be done after we are gone i shall let you know as soon as i can where the luggage that must follow us shall be addressed and instead of washing and ironing mrs wright i want you and one of the elder girls to assist me in making an inventory of everything i leave behind orders concerning which you will also receive by the post miss compton though a very quiet inmate and one whose regular habits gave little trouble was nevertheless a person of great importance at compton bassett and her commands thus distinctly expressed were implicitly obeyed so that before the usual hour of retiring for the night everything was arranged both for going and staying exactly as she had determined they should be it was singular to see with what unvacillating steadiness this feeble-looking old lady pursued her purpose no obstacle appeared of consequence sufficient to draw aside a thought from the main object she had in view but was either removed or passed over by an impulse that seemed as irresistible as the steam that causes the train to rush along the railroad making the way clear if it does not find it so at daybreak the silverton post chaise with four good horses and two smart post-boys were at the door and within ten minutes afterwards all adieus had been spoken all luggage stowed and miss compton who had never yet left her native country was proceeding full gallop towards the metropolis as you drive so you will be paid said william to the boys as they set off and they did drive as boys so bargained with generally do miss compton had shown equal quickness and good judgment in having secured the services of this william for he had repeatedly travelled with his late master and mistress to london was apt quick and intelligent and fully justified the expectation his new lady had formed that with carte blanche in the article of expense he would manage her journey as expeditiously and with as little trouble to herself as if she had been attended with a half a dozen outriders at exeter she dined and reposed herself for a couple of hours during which william undertook to hire a carriage for the journey furnished with a dicky behind and all other conveniences an arrangement which greatly lessened the fatigue to all parties and enabled the active-minded old lady to proceed as far as salisbury that night daybreak again found her en route and by means of william's conditional mode of payment to the positions miss compton arrived at Aberson's hotel by two o'clock in the afternoon it might be supposed from the exertion used to reach the wide city in which she knew poor agnes stood alone that miss compton would drive directly to half moon street and save her as early as possible from all farther anxiety but such was not her plan there was something still wanting to prove her repentance and her love before she could present herself before the forsaken agnes all her schemes all her wishes were explained to her efficient aide-de-camp and while she and the wondering peggy reposed themselves he was sent in search of handsome private lodgings which must be such as his master the member for silverton might have approved for his own family and then he was to proceed to livery stables where he was known and hire for her by the week a carriage and horses fit for ladies to use such were miss compton's vague but very judicious orders and the result was that by the time she had dined and taken an hour's nap upon the sofa a very respectable equipage was at the door awaiting her orders 
in and about this the light luggage she had brought with her was arranged and ten minutes drive brought her to handsome airy lodgings near the top of wimpole street where william thought he should be able to breathe himself and where his mistress and peggy knew as they were to smoke and dust might have as good a chance of doing so too as in any other street he could think of miss compton was pleased greatly pleased with her new confidant's promptitude and ability the carriage pleased her the horses the coachman the house the furniture and the obsequious landlady too all pleased her and she felt a degree of happiness as she set her peggy to make arrangements for the especial comfort and accommodation of agnes such as she had never known before it cured all fatigue it overpowered every feeling of strangeness in her new and most unwanted abode and gave a gaiety to her spirits and lightness to her heart that made her look as she stepped from room to room like one of the little benignant old fairies of which we read in french story-books by eight o'clock all her preparations were complete the tea-things placed on the drawing-room table peggy given to understand that she was to consider herself more as miss willoughby's personal attendant than her own and the carriage again at the door to convey her to the longed-for yet almost dreaded meeting in half moon street agnes had written to miss compton on monday and calculated that she might receive an answer to her letter on thursday morning but thursday morning was past and no letter arrived and when about half-past eight on that same evening she heard a carriage stop and the knocker thunder the only idea that suggested itself was that her aunt barnaby was returned and that she should have to plead for a night's lodging under her roof her spirits were weakened by disappointment she had heard nothing from cheltenham since colonel hubert's visit and this together with the non-arrival of any devonshire letter had caused a degree of depression to which she very rarely gave way what shall i say to her how shall i dare to meet her she exclaimed oh if she keeps her word what what will become of me she heard steps approaching and feeling convinced it was her aunt barnaby attempted in her terror to open the door that communicated with the other room but found it locked and trembling like a hunted fawn obliged to turn to bay she cast her eyes towards the dreaded door and saw miss compton gently and timidly entering by it aunt betsy she cried springing towards her and falling involuntarily upon her knees oh dear dear aunt betsy is it indeed possible that you are come for me the poor old lady's high-wrought energies almost failed her now and had not a chair stood near she would hardly have saved herself from falling on the floor beside her niece agnes poor child she said you thought i was too hard and too cruel to come near you i have been much to blame oh frightfully to blame will you forgive me dear one my poor pale girl you look ill agnes very very ill and is it not a fitting torment for me to see this fair bloodless cheek for did i not hate you for your rosy health agnes was indeed pale and though not fainting was so near it that while her aunt uttered this passionate address she had no power to articulate a word but she laid her cheek on the old lady's hands and there was something so caressing and so helpless in her attitude as she did this that poor miss compton was entirely overcome and wept aloud no sooner however had this first violent burst of emotion passed away than the happiness such a meeting was calculated to afford to them both was most keenly and delightfully felt miss compton looked at agnes as the blood beautifully tinged her delicate cheek again with such admiration and delight that it seemed likely enough notwithstanding her strong good sense on many points that she might now fall into another extreme and idolize the being she had so harshly thrust from her while the object of this new and unhoped-for affection seemed to feel it at her very heart and to be cheered and warmed by it like a tender plant receiving the first beams of the morning sun after the chilling coldness of the night at length miss compton remembered that she was not come there only to look at agnes and withdrawing her arms which she had thrown around her she said come my own child this is no roof for either of us have you much to remove is there more than a carriage can take agnes and will you take me with you now aunt betsy cried the delighted girl springing up wait but one moment and all i have shall be ready it is not much my books are packed and my trunk too the maid will help me ring the bell then love and let my servant take your packages down agnes obeyed her trunk aunt betsy's original trunk and the dear empton book-box were lodged on the driving-seat and the dicky of the carriage 
and william was just mounting the stairs to say that all was ready when another carriage was heard to stop and another knocking resounded against the open street door oh it is aunt barnaby cried agnes in a voice of terror is it replied miss compton in the lively tone of former days i shall be exceedingly glad to see her can you be in earnest aunt betsy said agnes looking very pale perfectly in earnest my dear child answered the old lady it will be greatly more satisfactory that she should be an eye-witness of your departure with me than that you should go without giving her notice perhaps she would say you had eloped and robbed the premises hush cried agnes she is here mrs barnaby's voice at least was already with them it was indeed the return of this lady which they had heard and no sooner had she dismissed her hackney coachman than she began questioning the servant of the house who was stationed at the open door expecting miss compton and her niece to come down what carriage is that whose servant is that upon the stairs you have not been letting the lodgings i hope were the first words of the widow oh dear no ma'am replied the maid everything is just as you left it then who is that carriage waiting for for a lady ma'am who is come to call on your young lady my young lady unnatural hussy and what fine friends has she found out here i wonder to visit her be they who they will they shall hear my opinion of her and with these words mrs barnaby mounted the last stair and entered the room the two unsnuffed tallow candles which stood on the table did not enable her at the first glance to recognize her aunt who was wrapped in a long silk cloak much unlike any garment she had ever seen her wear but the sable figure of agnes immediately caught her eye and she stepped towards her with her arm extended very much as if about to box her ears but it seemed that the action was only intended to intimate that she was instantly to depart for with raised voice and rapid utterance she said how comes it girl that i find you still here be gone never will i pass another night under the same roof with one who could so basely desert a benefactress in distress and who may this be that you have got to come and make merry with you while i and for your expenses too whoever it is they had better show no kindness to you or they will be sure to repent of it mrs barnaby then turned suddenly round to reconnoitre the unknown visitor do you not know me mrs barnaby said miss compton demurely my aunt betsy good god ma'am what brought you here i came to take this troublesome girl off your hands mrs barnaby is not that kind of me that's the plan is it retorted the widow bitterly now i understand it all instead of coming to comfort me in my misery she was employing herself in coaxing another aunt to make a sacrifice of herself to her convenience take her and when you are sick and sorry she will turn her back upon you as she has done upon me oh do not speak so cruelly aunt barnaby cried agnes greatly shocked at having her conduct thus described to one whose love she so ardently wished to gain tell my aunt compton what it was you asked of me and let her judge between us shut the door agnes said miss compton sternly and then reseating herself she addressed mrs barnaby with an air of much anxiety and interest niece martha i must indeed beg of you to tell me in what manner this young girl has conducted herself since she has been with you for i can assure you much depends upon the opinion i shall now form of her i have no longer any reason to conceal from you that my circumstances are considerably more affluent than anybody but myself and my man of business is aware of nearly forty years of strict economy niece martha have enabled me to realize a very respectable little fortune it was i and not my tenant who purchased your poor father's moiety of compton bassett and as i have scarcely ever touched the rents a little study of the theory of interest and compound interest will prevent your being surprised when i tell you that my present income is fifteen hundred per annum clear of all outgoings whatever is it possible exclaimed mrs barnaby with an accent and a look of reverence which very nearly destroyed the gravity of her old aunt yes mrs barnaby she resumed such is my income with less than this a gentlewoman of a good old family desirous of bringing forward a niece into the world in such a manner as to do her credit could not venture to take her place in society 
and i have therefore waited till my increasing revenues should amount to this sum before i declared my intentions and proclaimed my heiress such being the case you will not be surprised that i should be anxious to ascertain which of my two nieces best deserves my favour i do not mean to charge myself with both let that be clearly understood the doing so would entirely defeat my object which is to leave one representative of the compton bassett family with a fortune sufficient to restore its former respectability and everybody must admire such an intention replied mrs barnaby with an accent of inexpressible gentleness and i for one most truly hope that whoever you decide to leave it to may deserve such generosity and have a grateful heart to requite it with that is just what i should wish to find returned the spinster and before you came in i had quite made up my mind that agnes willoughby should be the person but i confess mrs barnaby that what you have said alarms me and i shall be very much obliged if you will immediately let me know what agnes has done to merit the accusation of having deserted her benefactress it is but too easy to answer that aunt compton replied the widow and i am sorry to speak against my own sister's child but truth is truth and since you command me to tell you what i meant when i said she had deserted me i will i have been arrested aunt compton and that for no reason on the earth but because i was tempted to stay three or four days longer in london than i intended of course i meant to go back to that paltry place cheltenham and pay every farthing i owed there the proof of which is that i have paid every farthing though it would have served them right to have kept them a year out of their money instead of a month but that's neither here nor there though there was no danger of my staying in prison i was there for three days and agnes could not tell but i might have been there for ever yet when i wrote her a most affectionate letter begging her only to call upon me in my miserable solitude she answered my petition which might have moved a heart of stone with a flat refusal ask her if she can deny this what say you agnes is this so said the old lady turning to the party accused aunt betsy said agnes and then stopped as if unwilling for some reason or other to say more yes or no demanded mrs barnaby vehemently did you refuse to come to me or not i did replied agnes i hope you are satisfied aunt compton cried the widow triumphantly by her own confession you perceive that i have told you nothing but the truth agnes said nothing in reply to this but loosening the strings of a silk bag which hung upon her arm she took from it a small packet and placed it in the hands of miss compton what have we got here said the spinster sharply what do you give me this for child i wish you to read what is there if you please aunt said agnes miss compton laid it on the table before her while she sought for her spectacles and adjusted them on her nose but while doing this she kept her eyes keenly fixed upon the little packet and not without reason for had she turned from it for a single instant mrs barnaby who shrewdly suspected its contents would infallibly have taken possession of it my coachman and horses will get tired of all this i think said miss compton however as you say niece martha truth is truth and must be sought after even if it lies at the bottom of a well this is a letter and directed to you miss agnes and this is the back of another with some young lady-like scrawling upon it which am i to read first pray the letter aunt betsy replied agnes so be it said the spinster with an air of great indifference and drawing one of the candles towards her and carefully snuffing it she began clearly and deliberately reading aloud the letter already given in which mrs barnaby desired the presence of agnes and gave her instructions for her finding her way to the fleet prison having finished this she replaced it quietly in its cover without saying a word or even raising her eyes towards either of her companions and taking the other paper containing agnes's reasons for non-compliance read that through likewise exactly in the same distinct tone and replaced it with an equal absence of all commentary in the cover she then rose and walking close up to her elder niece who proffered not a word looking in her face with a smile that must have been infinitely more provoking than the most violent indignation said niece martha the last time i saw you if i remember rightly you offered me some of your old clothes but now you offer me none which i consider as the more unkind because if you dressed as smart as you are now while in prison you must certainly wear very fine things when you are free 
and so as you are no longer the kind niece you used to be i don't think i shall come to see you any more as for this young lady here it appears to me that you have not been severe enough with her mrs barnaby i'll see if i can't teach her to behave better in prison or out of prison if i bid her come we shall see if she dare look about her for such plausible reasons for refusing as she has given you if she does i'll certainly send her back to you mrs barnaby ring the bell naughty agnes the maid seemed to have been very near the door for it instantly opened tell my servants that i am coming said the whimsical spinster enacting the fine lady with excellent effect and making a low slow and most ceremonious courtesy to the irritated but perfectly overpowered mrs barnaby she made a sign to agnes to precede her to the carriage and left the room End of chapter six volume three chapter seven of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven agnes elopes with her aunt betsy is it possible cried agnes the moment that the door of the carriage was closed upon them is it possible that i am really under your protection and going to your home aunt betsy to my temporary home dear child you are certainly going said the old lady taking her hand but i hope soon to have one more comfortable for you my agnes where i shall find the bower and the bees is it not so aunt not exactly at least not at present but tell me agnes don't you think i was very gentle and civil to mrs barnaby it was certainly very wise not to reproach her poor woman more directly but oh dearest aunt betsy how well you know her if you had studied for a twelvemonth to find out how you might best have tormented her you could have discovered no method so effectual as the making her first believe that you had a great fortune and then that her own conduct had robbed her of your favour poor aunt barnaby i cannot help pitying her you are very tender-hearted my dear and a flatterer too you give me credit i assure you for a vast deal more cleverness than i possess excepting on the subject of the old clothes which she offered me when we met in the cottage of dame sims i attempted no jestings with her but tell me agnes have you not suffered dreadfully from the tyranny and vulgar ignorance of this detestable woman has she not almost broken your young heart i have not been very happy with her aunt betsy replied agnes gently but she speaks only truth when she says i have lived at her cost and this ought to close my lips against speaking more against her than may be necessary to clear my own conduct in your eyes perhaps the old lady was a little disappointed at finding that she was to have no good stories concerning the absurdities of the apothecary's high-flying widow as she called her but despite all the oddities of miss compton there was quite enough of the innate feeling of a gentle woman within her to make her value agnes the more for her promised forbearance she threw her arm round her and pressing her to her bosom said let this feeling of christian gentleness be extended to me also agnes or i have a great need of it this martha wise at the second poor soul was the first-born of her mother and seems to have taken as her birthright all the qualities bodily and mental of her vulgar and illiterate dam but i have no such excuse my child for the obstinate prejudice with which my heart has been filled and my judgment absolutely confounded all you have suffered with this woman agnes ought in truth to be laid to my charge i knew what she was and yet i suffered you let us try to forget it and only remember if you can that i turned away from you for no other reason upon earth than because i feared you were not exactly what i now find you but here we are at home how greatly must you want the healing feeling that home should bring poor dear when have you ever felt it at empton aunt answered agnes eagerly and even though the carriage door was open and the step let down she added the only home i ever loved i owed to you hastily as this word was said it sunk with very healing effect into the heart of the self-reproaching old lady it was answered by a cordial god bless you and hand in hand the very happy pair walked up the staircase together the accomplished william had preceded them and thrown open the door of aunt betsy's handsome drawing-room and no apartment could offer an aspect of more comfort the evening had all the chilliness of september when its sun is gone and the small bright fire with a sofa placed cosily near it looked cheerily 
wax lights on the chimney and tea-table gave light sufficient to show a large exceedingly well fitted up room and a pretty young woman neatly dressed came forward to offer her services in the removal of cloaks and shawls agnes looked around the room and then turned to her aunt as if tacitly demanding an explanation of what she saw miss compton smiled and answered the appeal by saying did you expect dearest that i should be able to bring my farmhouse and my bees with me no aunt compton replied agnes very gravely i did not expect that but aunt betsy you must always call me aunt betsy agnes that was the appellation that your dear voice uttered so joyously when i entered the dark den in which i found you and i shall never like any other as well but don't be frightened because i have somewhat changed my mode of living my dear child i will not invite you to ramble through the streets of london in order to visit me when i am in prison for debt i know what my means are agnes few ladies better and i will never exceed them this was said very gravely and the assurance was by no means unimportant to the tranquillity of the young heiress the scenes she had recently passed through would have reconciled her to a farmhouse a cottage a hut so that the air of heaven blew untainted round it and no livery stable keepers or bailiff's followers could find entrance there but miss compton's words and manner set her heart at rest on that score though they could not remove her astonishment the involuntary expression of which on her beautiful face was by no means disagreeable to the novel read aunt betsy it was just as it should be beauty goodness misery ill usage and all and she felt most happily convinced that if there were but a lover in the case and such a one as despite all obstacles she could approve she should to her dying day have the comfort of thinking that the moment which she had chosen for ceasing to accumulate and beginning to spend was the very best possible and this lover in the clouds would agnes open her heart to her on such a subject had she any right to hope it not yet certainly not yet thought miss compton as the services of william over and the tea-things removed they drew nearer the fire and she fixed her eyes anew on the beautiful face she so greatly loved to contemplate partly because it was so beautiful and partly because she could not trace in it the slightest resemblance to any member of the wise at race but soft and peaceful as was now the expression on that face there might occasionally be seen by an accurate observer that indescribable look of thoughtfulness in the eyes which never arises till the mind has been awakened upon some subject or other to emotions of deep interest miss compton was a very accurate observer and saw as plainly as lavater himself could have done that agnes had learned to feel the romantic old lady would have given her right hand to possess her confidence but she was determined not to ask for it do you think we shall be happy together agnes said she in a voice which when its cheerful tone was not exaggerated into the ironical levity in which she sometimes indulged was singularly pleasing do you think that you shall like to be my darling yes i do replied agnes with a sudden bluntness of sincerity but i think i shall plague you sometimes aunt betsy you have made up your mind to that already have you returned miss compton delighted at the playful tone in which she spoke then in that case i must make up my mind too and contrive to make a pleasure of what you call a plague how do you mean to begin agnes what will you do first will you cry for the moon <laughs> will you try to get it for me if i do aunt betsy said agnes laughing yes i will that is if you will let me know what sort of moon it is and to what part of the heavens i must turn to find it jupiter you know has oh my moon is the highest and brightest of them all said agnes with a sigh and after remaining silent for a moment she added aunt betsy may i tell you everything that has happened to me if you love me well enough to do this my child said the delighted old lady while nevertheless a tear glistened in her clear black eye if you love me well enough i shall feel that i have not given up my bees and my flowers for nothing agnes drew nearer and after a moment's hesitation began i believe that all young ladies histories have something about a gentleman in them and so has mine a young gentleman i hope agnes interrupted the aunt with a smile agnes coloured a little but replied he is not so very young aunt betsy as to make his youth his most remarkable quality very well that is all quite right he ought to be older than you my dear go on when i was at clifton aunt betsy i was often in company with colonel hubert a colonel that sounds very respectable he was the father i suppose of the gentleman no indeed replied agnes with some vexation he is himself the only gentleman that i have anything to say about 
and his sister says that he will be a general next month indeed a general general hubert a very eligible acquaintance i have no doubt i should hardly have hoped you could have had the good luck to meet with such among the friends of your aunt barnaby an eligible acquaintance oh aunt you don't understand me at all but i will tell you everything colonel hubert is i can't describe him i hope you will see him aunt betsy and then you will not wonder perhaps that i should have thought him from the very first moment i saw him the only person in the world agnes stopped short but miss compton seemed to think she had finished her phrase very properly and what did he think of you my dear this young colonel colonel hubert never said anything about it at clifton replied agnes blushing but yet i thought i hoped he liked me though i knew it did not signify whether he did or not for he is one of a very distinguished family who could never i imagined think seriously of any one living with with my aunt barnaby but at cheltenham i became acquainted with his aunt lady elizabeth norris and his sister lady stephenson and they were very very kind to me and when i came to london with my aunt barnaby in this wild manner they were very anxious about me and made me promise to write them but before i thought they could know anything about her being taken to prison the very day indeed that she went there in the evening while i was sitting in that dismal room just as you found me to-night colonel hubert oh aunt betsy the sight of you did not surprise me more colonel hubert walked in that was hardly right though agnes if he knew you were alone he brought a letter from his aunt and sister most kindly asking me to take shelter with them immediately and i am quite sure that when he came he had no intention of speaking of anything but that but i believe i looked very miserable and his generous heart could not bear it so he told me that he loved me and asked me to be his wife it was generous of him at such a dreadful moment said the spinster her eyes again twinkling through tears and how did you answer him my love i told him replied agnes trembling and turning pale as she spoke i told him that i could never be his wife why my dear i thought you said cried the old lady looking much disappointed i thought you said you admired him of all things and i am sure he seems to have deserved it but i suppose you thought he was too old for you no 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 replied agnes vehemently he is young enough for me to love him oh so dearly it was because i could not bear that he should marry so beneath himself it was because i thought his aunt and sister would resent it humph that was very generous on your part too but i suppose he knows best and what did he say then agnes oh aunt betsy he said exactly as you did he said that he was too old for me to love him and remembering the agony of that moment she hid her face in her hands and wept miss compton looked at her with pitying eyes and after a moment said and you so parted agnes yes she replied removing her hands it was almost so and yet not quite i could not tell him you know how dearly how very dearly i loved him that was impossible but i said something about his sister and his aunt and then oh i shall never forget him something like hope pray do not think me vain aunt betsy but it was hope that shot into his eye again and changed the whole expression of his face yet he said no more about his love and only asked me to promise never to leave the shelter of that roof till i heard from his aunt again and i did promise him but could i keep it aunt it would have been obeying him in words and not in spirit and now i'm coming to my reason for telling you all this so very soon what shall i say to them now how shall i write to them it seemed that miss compton did not find this a very easy question to answer for she took many minutes to consider of it at length she said as to setting right the love part of the affair you need not alarm yourself my dear there will be no great difficulty in that if you know your own mind and really are in love with a general instead of an ensign i don't see why you should be contradicted though it is a little out of the common way he is a gentleman and that is the only point upon which i could have been very strict with you but there is another thing agnes in which you must please to let me have my own way will you promise me how can there be any way but yours in what concerns me dear aunt betsy bless you my dear i will not be a tyrant at least not a very cruel tyrant 
but my happiness will be injured for the rest of my life agnes if the next time you see this gentleman and his family it is not in such a manner as to make them perceive without the necessity of their listening to an old woman's long story about it that you are not an unworthy match for him in any way let this be managed and everything will end well there will be no risk of your witnessing either in the words or looks of these noble ladies whom you call your friends any struggle between their partiality for you and their higher hopes for him he will ever remember with pleasure that he waited not for this to offer you his hand and heart and trust me you will never remember with sorrow that you did wait for it before you accepted him do you agree with me indeed i do fervently replied agnes but could they see me at this moment would not your wish be answered could they doubt for a moment while seeing you and seeing the style of all about you that i am something more than the poor hopeless dependent of mrs barnaby that is not it that would not do at all child replied the old lady sharply it shall not be the poor dependent of anybody that this noble-hearted colonel hubert shall come to woo love him as much as you will the world may say and his family may think too that his rank and station led you to accept him i will save you both from this danger colonel hubert shall not try his chance with you again till you are the independent possessor of fifteen hundred pounds a year when i die agnes if you behave well in the interim i will bequeath my bees to you and all the furniture of my two pretty rooms at compton basset as well as all the reserved rents in the shape of allowances coals wood attendance and the like which will be mine while i live this my dear shall come to you in the way of legacy in case i continue to be pleased with your behaviour but there is no way for me to atone for the injury i have done to the representative of my family by suffering her to remain six months with mrs barnaby but making her at once the independent possessor of the compton property my dear dear aunt said agnes most unfeignedly distressed there can be no occasion at this moment to talk of your doing what in my poor judgment would be so very wrong should i be so happy as to make colonel hubert known to you i would trust to him to discuss such subjects oh what delight aunt betsy for you to have such a man for your friend and all owing to me there was something so ingenuous so young so unquestionably sincere in this burst of feeling that the old lady was greatly touched by it you are a sweet creature agnes she replied and quite right in telling me not to discuss any matters of business with you i shall touch on no such subjects again for i see they are totally beyond your comprehension nevertheless i must have my way about not introducing myself to colonel hubert's family or himself either in lodgings write to your kind friends my dear tell them that your old aunt compton has left her retirement to take care of you and tell them also that she feels as she ought to do but no you write your own feelings and i will write mine but this must be to-morrow agnes it is past twelve o'clock love see that gay thing on the chimney-piece attests it i must show you to your room my guest hereafter i shall be yours perhaps peggy being summoned the two ladies were lighted to the rooms above these were in a style of great comfort and even elegance but one being somewhat larger than the other and furnished with a dressing-room it was in this that agnes found her trunk and book-box and it was here that after seeing that her fire burned brightly and that peggy was standing ready to assist in undressing her the happy miss compton embraced blessed and left her to repose it was a long time however before agnes would believe that anything like sleep could visit her eyes that night what a change what an almost incredible transition had she passed through since her last sleep it was more like the operation of a magician's wand than consequence of human events from being a reprobated outcast banished from the roof that sheltered her she had become the sole object of love and care to one who seemed to have it in her power to make life a paradise to her how many blissful visions floated through her brain before all blended together in one general consciousness of happy security that at last lulled her to a delicious sleep she was hardly less sensible than her somewhat proud aunt of the pleasure which a reunion with her cheltenham friends under circumstances so changed would bring and her dreams were of receiving lady elizabeth norris and her niece in a beautiful palace of the shores of a lovely lake while colonel hubert stood smiling by to watch the meeting End of chapter seven
Volume three, chapter eight of the Widow Barnaby by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eight. Agnes appears likely to profit by the change of aunts. The first waking under the consciousness of new and not yet familiar happiness is perhaps one of the most delightful sensations of which we are susceptible agnes had closed her eyes late and it was late when she opened them for peggy had already drawn her window curtains and the gay hangings and large looking-glasses of the apartment met her eyes at the first glance with such brilliant effect that she fancied for an instant she must still be dreaming but by degrees all the delightful truth returned upon her mind where was the blank cold isolation of the heart with which her days were used to rise and set where were the terrors amidst which she lived lest her protectress should expose herself by some monstrous new absurdity where was the hopeless future before which she had so often wept and trembled was it possible that she was the same agnes willoughby who had awoke with such an aching heart but four-and-twenty hours ago all these questions were asked and gaily answered before she had resolution to spring from her bed and change her delightful speculations for a more delightful reality notwithstanding the various fatigues of the preceding day miss compton was not only in the drawing-room but her letter to lady elizabeth norris was already written on the third side of a sheet of letter-paper thus giving agnes an opportunity of explaining everything before her own lines should meet her ladyship's eye the meal which had been slandered as lazy lounging and most unsocial was far otherwise on the present occasion the aunt and niece sat down together each regaling the eyes of the other with a countenance speaking the most heartfelt happiness and while the old lady indulged herself with sketching plans for the future the young one listened as if her voice were that of fate declaring that she should never taste of sorrow more the carriage will be here at twelve agnes said miss compton to take us into what our books tell us is called the city as if it were the city of cities and about which i suppose you and i are equally ignorant seeing that you never did take that pleasant little walk the dowager mrs barnaby so considerately sketched out for you so now we shall look at it together but don't fancy my dear that any such idle project as looking at its wonders is what takes me there now i have got a broker agnes as well as the widow and it is quite as necessary to my proceedings as to hers that i should see him but we must not go till our partnership letter is ready for the post here is my share of it agnes read it to me and if it meets your approbation sit down and let your own precede it the lines written by miss compton were as follows madam permit a stranger closely connected by the ties of blood to agnes willoughby to return her grateful thanks for kindness extended to her at a moment when she greatly needed it that she should so have needed it will ever be a cause of self-reproach to me nor will it avail me much either in my own opinion or in that of others that the same qualities in our common kinswoman mrs barnaby which produced the distress of agnes produced in me the aversion which kept me too distant to perceive their effects on her respectability and happiness i am madam your grateful and obedient servant elizabeth compton agnes wrote my kind and generous friends lady elizabeth lady stephenson i write to you as i never dared hope to do from under the eye and the protection of my dear aunt compton it is to her i owe all the education i ever received and i might add all the happiness too for i have never known any happy home but that which her liberal kindness procured for me during five years spent in the family of my beloved instructress mrs wilmot for the seven months that have elapsed since i quitted mrs wilmot my situation as you my kind friends know but too well has been one of very doubtful respectability but very certain misery my aunt compton blames herself for this but you if i should ever be so happy as to make you know my aunt compton will blame me her former kindness ought to have given me courage to address her before even though circumstances had placed me so entirely in the hands of mrs barnaby as to make the separation between us fearfully wide but thank god all this unhappiness is now over i did apply to her at last and the result has been the converting me from a very hopeless friendless and miserable girl as i was when you first saw me into one of the very happiest persons in the whole world i have passed through some scenes from the remembrance of which i shall always shrink with pain but there have been others there have been points in my little history which have left an impression a thousand times deeper and dearer too than ever could have been produced on any heart unsoftened by calamity 
and must it not ever be accounted among my best sources of happiness that the regard which can never cease to be the most precious as well as the proudest boast of my life was expressed under circumstances which to most persons would have appeared so strongly against me my generous friends may i hope that the affection shown to me in sorrow will not be withdrawn now that sorrow is past may i hope that we shall meet again and that i may have the great happiness of making my dear aunt known to you she is all kindness and would take me to cheltenham that i might thank you in person for the aid so generously offered in my hour of need but i fear poor mrs barnaby's adventures will for some time be too freshly remembered there for me to wish to revisit it when agnes had written thus far she stopped where shall i tell them aunt betsy that we are going to remain she said if if colonel hubert and she stopped again if colonel hubert and what then agnes why if colonel hubert were to pay us a visit aunt betsy i cannot help thinking he would understand me better now than when i was so dreadfully overpowered by the feeling of my desolate condition don't you think so i think it very probable he might my dear and as to your sensible question agnes of where we are going to be i think you must decide it yourself we have both declared against cheltenham and for reasons good where then should you best like to go to clifton aunt betsy it was there i saw him first and there too i was most kindly treated by friends who i believe pitied me because because i did not seem happy i suppose oh i would rather go to clifton than any place in the world excepting empton and to empton we cannot go just at present agnes it would be too much like running out of the world again which i have no wish at all to do to clifton therefore we will go dear child and so you may tell your good friends agnes gave no other answer than walking round the table and imprinting a kiss upon the forehead of her happy aunt then resuming her writing she thus concluded her letter my aunt compton as soon as she has concluded some business which she has to settle in london will go to clifton where i believe we shall stay for some months and should any of your family happen again to be there i may perhaps be happy enough to see them with gratitude to all i remain ever your attached and devoted agnes willoughby poor agnes she was terribly dissatisfied with her letter when she had written it not all her generalizations could suffice to tell him the him the only mortal him she remembered in the world not all her innocent little devices to make it understood that he was included in all her gratitude and love as well as in her invitation to clifton made it at all clear that she wanted colonel hubert to come and offer to her again yet what could she say more she sat with her eye fixed on the paper and a face full of meaning though what that meaning was it might not be very easy to decide what is my girl thinking of said miss compton i am thinking replied agnes and she shook her head i am thinking that colonel hubert will never understand from this letter aunt betsy how very much i want to see him again that is very true my dear is there anything else i could say to make him know how greatly he mistook me when he fancied i said no for my want of love oh yes my dear certainly tell me then my dear dear aunt i feel as if i had no power to find a word tell me what i shall say to him you may say many things for instance you may say tell my beloved colonel hubert oh aunt betsy aunt betsy you are laughing at me cried agnes looking at her very gravely and with an air of melancholy reproach so i am my dear an old spinster of three score is but a poor confidant in matters of this sort but if you seriously ask for my advice i will give it such as it is let our letter go just as it is without any addition or alteration whatever if colonel hubert sees this letter as you seem to expect and if he loves you as you deserve to be loved he will find food enough for hope therein to carry him further than from one end of gloucestershire to the other if he does not see it but what you will in it he would learn nothing thereby but if seeing it he determines to sit quietly down under your refusal then let him i for one should feel no wish to become better acquainted with the gentleman agnes said no more but folded the letter and directed it to lady elizabeth norris cheltenham now aunt i have folded up colonel hubert and put him out of sight till he shall choose to bring himself forward again i will tease you no more about him shall i put my bonnet on the carriage has been waiting for some time 
my darling agnes said the old lady looking fondly at her how little i deserve to find you so exactly what i wished you should be you are right we will talk no more of this colonel hubert till he has himself declared what part he means to play in the drama before us we shall be at no loss for subjects remember how much we have to settle between us our establishment our equipage our wardrobes all to be decided upon modelled and provided get ready dearest the sooner we get through our business the earlier we shall be at clifton and who knows which part of our dramatis personae may arrive there first a happy smile dimpled the cheek of agnes as she ran out of the room to equip herself and in a few minutes the two ladies were en route towards the city what makes you wear such very deep mourning my dear said miss compton fixing her eyes on the perennial black crape bonnet of her companion is it all for the worthy apothecary of silverton but that can't be either for now i think of it his charming widow had half the colours of the rainbow about her what does it mean agnes agnes looked out of the window to conceal a smile but recovering her composure answered i have never been out of mourning aunt since mr barnaby died there was a great deal of black not worn out and as it made no difference to me oh monstrous interrupted miss compton i see it all while she wantons about like a painted butterfly she has thrown her chrysalis case upon you my pretty agnes in the hope of making you look like a grub beside her is it not so oh no my aunt barnaby loves dress certainly and greatly dislikes black and so and so you are to wear it for her well agnes you shan't abuse her if you think it a sin god forbid but do not refuse to let me into a few of her ways did she ever ask you to put on her widow's cap my dear it might have saved the expense of nightcaps at least it was almost a cruelty in agnes to conceal the many characteristic traits of selfish littleness which she had witnessed in her widowed aunt from the caustic contemplation of her spinster one for she would have enjoyed it but it was so much in her nature to do so that dearly as she would have loved to amuse aunt betsy and give scope to her biting humour on any other theme she gave her no encouragement on this so by degrees all allusion to mrs barnaby dropped out of their discourse and if from time to time some little sample of her peculiarities peeped forth involuntarily in speaking of the past the well-schooled old lady learned to enjoy them in silence and certainly did not love her niece the less for the restraint thus put upon her considering how complete a novice our spinster practically was as to everything concerning the vast babylon called london she contrived to go where she wished and where she willed with wonderfully few blunders it was all managed between william and herself and agnes marvelled at the ease with which much seemingly important business was transacted the carriage was stopped before a very dusky-looking mansion at no great distance from the exchange within the dark passage of which william disappeared for some moments and then returning opened the carriage door and without uttering a word gave his arm to assist miss compton to descend i will not keep you waiting long my dear she said and without further explanation followed her confidential attendant into the house in about half an hour she returned accompanied by a bald-headed yellow-faced personage who somewhat to the surprise of agnes mounted the carriage after her and placed himself as bodkin between them to the bank was the word of command then given and in a moment they again stopped and agnes was once more left alone the interval during which she was thus left was this time considerably longer than the last and she had long been tired of watching the goers and comers all bearing however varied their physiognomy the same general stamp of busy anxious interest upon their brows before the active old lady and her bald-headed acquaintance reappeared the old gentleman handed her into the carriage and then took his leave amidst a multitude of obsequious bows and assurances that her commands should always be obeyed at the shortest notice etc 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 agnes said the old lady as soon as she had exchanged a few words with william as to where she next wished to go agnes i look to you to supply the place of my bees and my flowers and i do not much fear that i shall lament the exchange but you must not continue to be dight in this grim fashion it might be soothing to the feelings of mr barnaby's fond widow but to me it is very sad and disagreeable and so my dear here is wherewithal to change it during the whole of this speech miss compton had been employed in extracting a pocket-book of very masculine dimensions from her pocket 
and having at length succeeded she opened it drew forth two bank-notes of twenty-five pounds each and laid them in the lap of her niece agnes took them up and looked at them with unfeigned astonishment my dear aunt she said i am afraid you will find me a much younger and more ignorant sort of girl than you expected i shall no more know what to do with all this money than a child of five years old you forget aunt betsy that i have never had any money of my own since i was born and i really do not understand anything about it this is a trouble of a new and peculiar kind my dear and i really don't remember in all my reading to have found a precedent for it what shall we do agnes must you always wear this rusty-looking black gown because you don't know how to buy another why no aunt i don't think that will be necessary either but don't you think it would be better for you to buy what you like for me it won't be the first time aunt betsy i have not forgotten when my pretty trunk was opened by mrs wilmot or how very nicely everything was provided for the poor ragged little girl who never before as long as she could remember had possessed anything beside threadbare relics cobbled up to suit her dimensions it was you who thought of everything for me then and i am quite sure you love me a great deal better now and agnes placed the notes in miss compton's hands as she spoke i had prepared myself for a variety of new occupations replied the spinster but choosing the wardrobe of an elegant young lady was certainly not one of them however my dear i have no objection to show you that my studies have prepared me for this too nothing like novel reading depend upon it for teaching a solitary recluse the ways of the world you shall see how ably i will expend this money agnes but do not turn your head away and be thinking of something else all the time because it is absolutely necessary i do assure you that a young lady in possession of fifteen hundred a year should know how to buy herself a new bonnet and gown the value of miss compton's literary researches was by no means lowered in the estimation of agnes by the results of the three hours which followed for though there were moments in which her thoughts would spring away in spite of all she could do to prevent it from discussions on silks and satins to a meditation on her next interview with colonel hubert she was nevertheless sufficiently present to what was passing before her eyes to be aware that an old lady who has herself lived in a grogram gown for half a century may be capable of making a mighty pretty collection of finery for her niece provided that she has paid proper attention to fashionable novels and knows how to ask counsel as to what artiste to drive to from so intelligent an aide-de-camp as william in short by the united power of the money and the erudition she had hoarded miss compton contrived in the course of a fortnight to make as complete a change in the equipments of agnes as that performed of yore upon cinderella by her godmother nor was her own wardrobe neglected she had no intention that the rusticity of her spinster aunt should draw as many eyes on agnes as the gaudiness of her widowed one and proved herself as judicious in the selection of sable satins and velvets for herself as in the choice of all that was most becoming and elegant for the decoration of her lovely niece never certainly was an old lady more completely happy than the eccentric proud warm-hearted aunt betsy as with a well-filled purse she drove about london and found everything she deemed suitable to the proper setting forth of her heiress ready to her hand or her order she could not indeed have a carriage built for her she could not afford time for it but william the indefatigable william ransacked long acre from one end to the other till he had discovered an equipage as perfect in all its points as any order could have made it and on this the well-instructed miss compton whose heraldic lore was quite sufficient to enable her with perfect accuracy to blazon her own arms had her lozenge painted in miniature which being all that was required to render the neat equipage complete this portion of their preparation did not cause any delay to miss peters agnes wrote of all the unexpected good which had befallen her with much freer confidence than she could indulge in when addressing the relations of colonel hubert her friend mary already knew the name of miss compton of compton bassett and no fear of appearing boastful rendered it necessary for her to conceal how strangely the aspect of her worldly affairs was changed to her and her good-natured mother was confided the task of choosing lodgings for them and so ably was this performed that exactly in one fortnight and three days from the time colonel hubert had left agnes so miserably alone in mrs barnaby's melancholy lodgings in half moon street she was established in airy and handsome apartments in the mall of clifton with every comfort and elegance about her that thoughtful and ingenious affection could suggest to make the contrast more striking 
the happiness of this meeting with the kind friends who had conceived so warm an affection for her even when presented by mrs barnaby was in just proportion to the hopeless sadness with which she had bid them farewell and the reception of her munificent aunt among them with the cordial good understanding which mutually ensued did all that fate and fortune could do to atone for the suffering endured since they had parted End of chapter eight